Thank you so much for taking time today and this week. We're actually celebrating what's called Septic Smart Week. So again, it's a week all focused on just doing more education uh, related to septic systems. Um, my name is Sarah Hager. I work at the University of Minnesota in the Water Resource Center. Um, this event is also being sponsored by Ottertail County. If you happen to be a resident or have a home in Ottertail County, um, and we'll get right into it here. Um, just a little bit of background about why uh, the University of Minnesota is doing this training. Actually, since the mid 70s, uh, we've been doing training on septic systems. Um, historically, we focused on training professionals. So those would be students here at the university, designers, installers, inspectors, maintainers, and service providers. But uh, that's what kind of started in 1974. But we've also, we also do many other things. We do research and demonstration. We do events like uh, you're participating in today. And we also work with small communities that have wastewater challenges. So with that, I'm gonna get into the topic of the day, which is really talking about what septic systems are and how to properly manage them. So we're first gonna really focus on what is a good subsurface sewage treatment system. So that's the acronym we use in Minnesota. More generically, we often call these septic systems or on-site systems. The picture you see here in the image uh, is actually what's often the most common system that is in Minnesota and across the country, which is just a simple drain field. And we're gonna talk more particularly about how that drain field takes the wastewater from our home and recycles that back into the environment. After that water is used in our home, it's gonna go one of two places. It's either gonna go into groundwater, that might be a shallow groundwater or a deep groundwater, or it may move laterally to a, a lake, river, or stream. But in either case, it's very important that that wastewater be properly treated because we know someone is going to want to use that septic system again. So again, what is a good septic system? Well, these first two, I think, are really obvious to everyone that sewage should not back them into your home, uh, even though there are people that sometimes if they do four loads of laundry in one day, and we'll talk about laundry more later, they may have a backup. Or there may be people that have the second one, which where they have sewage uh, that creates a wet spot in their yard, or we occasionally still do have systems that directly discharge into a lake, river, or stream. So with both of those first two instances, there's the direct ability for humans to interact with that wastewater or other vectors such as mosquitoes or rodents that could carry that, or your dog who loves that stinky wet area to bring infectious diseases back into our home and spread contaminants more broadly. So the other two are a little harder to see, but the third one you'll see is that they have a watertight septic tank. So there's two reasons you may not, or a property may not have a watertight septic tank. The first is in the 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s in parts of Minnesota and certainly across the country, we installed tanks that were designed to leak. Sometimes these are called dry wells or cesspools or leaching pits. Those do not adequately treat the contaminants before we reach that water we're trying to protect. The other type of tank that can be a problem is a tank that got damaged. Uh, so many of the tanks we use are made of concrete. Concrete can get cracks in it. Or if you're using a plastic or fiberglass tank, it could have gotten deformed and it's letting wastewater in or out. So those are problems. So we need to have a good watertight tank. And the last one is, is we need to have enough dry soil to treat the contaminants. So we're gonna talk about organic material, bacteria and viruses and phosphorus. In order to treat all of those, we need to have soil that is not wet. Um, if it's wet, it tends to let the contaminants move with the water. So in order for the soil microbes and the soil characteristics to either absorb or break down those contaminants, that soil needs to be unsaturated. We also know that bedrock or other limiting conditions are not going to adequately treat and disperse that water back into the environment. So kind of walking through a little bit more about what's in your backyard, Every septic system starts with a septic tank. 
Um, and this is very similar to what a wastewater treatment plant looks like. Uh, even there, they have what's called primary treatment, where our, the primary goal of that septic tank is to settle things out. So things that you know are lighter uh, in density, so those would be oils and greases and soaps, right, are going to float to the top. Uh, heavier material is going to settle to the bottom. So it is then going to actually work in that tank to decompose organic material. So if you've ever smelled a septic tank, to me, they, it's a beautiful smell because what you're actually smelling is anaerobic digestion, that the bacteria, and those bacteria really start in our guts. And as we put our waste out into the system, those anaerobic microbes continue to break down the solids that are in that tank. Not everything is degradable, so the septic tank will also store some of those inorganic solids. So we'll look at a picture kind of coming up. Um, so here is a picture of a modern septic tank. This may not be what the tank in your backyard looks like. You may, for instance, only have one manhole. Your manhole may not come to the surface, but if you were to put in a new septic tank today in Minnesota, this is what your tank would look like. Again, the wastewater comes in from the home at the left or the structure, whatever, wherever you happen to be living, it could be a business. And there's a baffle on the way in. Again, the purpose of that baffle on the way in is to actually, again, um, make sure that the wastewater, so kind of here again, that the wastewater doesn't just short circuit the tank. We want it to travel down and have a good detention time in that tank. So in order for settling and that digestion to happen, we, have, we want several days that the wastewater is retained in this tank. You'll notice there's typically going to be a baffle on the way out of the tank as well. That baffle makes sure that that scum that is sitting on top of uh, the wastewater level at the top there uh, does not go to either whatever's downstream, which is more commonly going to be your drain field, maybe a mound system. So I mentioned those three layers. I'm just going to highlight, again, the scum at the top, the cleaner liquid layer of wastewater. And again, it's not clean when it leaves the septic tank, but particularly a lot of the solids that are present in wastewater are removed. And then finally, the sludge. And later we'll talk about maintenance, but over time, these layers get thicker. And that's really the critical reason why we need maintenance. So just a couple other things I want to point out. I mentioned that not everyone's riser and manhole is to grade, but it is optimum. And that's why new systems do have them at grade is because that is where, again, we are going to perform service on that tank where we're going to clean it out. The other thing that you'll notice that this tank has is um, an optional um, an effluent screen. So I'll show some pictures coming up here, but the purpose of that screen is to make sure as much as possible those solids stay in the tank, which helps lengthen uh, the life of our soil treatment system. So here I mentioned are some of those pictures. Effluent screens come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, they don't usually look clean like the one in the middle, which is on a new, uh, new system. What they'll look like when you're servicing them is one on the left. So you'll see that that screen has catched solids that otherwise would have passed down to uh, the downstream components. So these generally replace that outlet baffle that, that I showed, and they do need to have a riser to grade for maintenance. Sarah, if I could interrupt real quick, uh, there is a live question from a Justin Fuhr asking about uh, what you meant by uh, out-of-date tanks were made out of cement. Oh, okay. Um, and I think maybe after this, Chris, we'll, we'll, we might hold the questions till the end, but I'm happy to answer this one here. Sure. Um, so concrete tanks themselves are not out of date. Um, if your concrete or any tank, any tank material has a crack that is letting wastewater leak out of that tank, um, that then is uh, it's not a good thing because the septic tank is designed to be a watertight structure. So I think this picture kind of shows well how a system kind of operates, is that the wastewater leaves your home. And for many of us, the home, uh, the wastewater leaves the home via gravity. Sometimes you may have to have a pump to deal with lower elevations, but commonly it leaves via gravity. Sometimes, and optimally, you'll have a clean out. 
You may not if this distance is really short, but you may have a clean out. But so then the purpose of that tank again is to allow that settling and anaerobic digestion, but it is not designed to let wastewater out through any other outlet, except that the outlet that goes to that downstream component. So um, in this case, what you see again is similar to the first one I showed, which is a trench system. Um, but what I want to highlight is that one thing I talked about earlier, which was the separation to the limiting condition. So you'll see again, uh, again, for new systems that are installed, we are always, and even historically in Minnesota, we have always designed for three foot of separation to make sure we're dealing with the bacteria and the viruses, the phosphorus, the organic material. So there are some properties where you may not naturally have enough soil to make this work. The first picture I showed showed it kind of flat, but if you don't have a flat backyard, we often use a system like this that kind of steps down uh, the landscape. So in order for this system to work and be below grade, you need about four and a half feet of dry soil. And there's just some many situations, you know, being the land of 10,000 lakes, we have a lot of high water tables, some parts of Minnesota to have heavier a loam to clay soils that tend to hold on to moisture. So in some of those situations, we end up having um, a mound system. So here again, just kind of walks through that we have where our wastewater is generated and you are a very important part of the system because what you put down the drain matters. So then we have our primary treatment and then finally our soil treatment. So moving on to mound systems. So mound systems provide treatment by taking that effluent from the septic tank. It then goes into the pump tank as the image shows here. So that always has a pump that then spreads that wastewater out over the top of the sand. So in that sand, then again, we have wastewater clarification, organic removal. And again, what we're now doing is pre-treating the wastewater before it hits the original soil. So generally, again, we're gonna use mound systems at, sh at sites with shallow soils to a limiting condition. So thinking about where we generate wastewater in a home, sometimes you will hear two different kind of classifications like you see on, on the left, black water versus gray water. But at the end of the day, all of our wastewater needs treated. Anything that has been contaminated with us, our bathing, washing our dishes, washing our clothes. And looking at the diagram on the right, you'll see in the average home, and you may not have the average home, but we look at homes, generally speaking, you'll see the number one water user in a home is your toilet. Uh, that is then followed by your showers and faucets. The next big appliance in our home is our clothes washer. And this one always bums me out when I see how much water we actually lose, or I would I would argue waste due to leaks in our home. And this is something easy as a property owner that you can manage. The last one here again would be other kind of, you know, this might be using water outside your home uh, to like wash your car. This could be your water softener. So other uses besides our typical ones. So our residential systems are typically sized using bedrooms because that really predicts the maximum occupancy of a home. It doesn't guarantee it. Most people, it overestimates how much water we use, but there's always the exception to if you have multi-generation households or let's say everybody comes and visits you over the 4th of July, you may be well beyond your occupancy, but assuming two people per bedroom, which is what our rules assume, uh, we use 150 gallons per bedroom. But we should always try to conserve water because if you look at the estimates on the right, if you're a, a typical person using 60 or 70 gallons per day, you'll see that you use 27,000 gallons of wastewater. You create 27,000 gallons of wastewater a year. Now take a home with three people in it. And I will just point that as you have more people in a home, your per person usage goes down a little bit. So a typical home with three people will use about 58,000 gallons of water a year. Now think about the area where your septic system is in your backyard. To me, that's a lot of water. 
that that septic system is able to recycle back into the environment. And now if you think about the community you live in, or maybe you live around a lake or near a river, um, or even in a small town, let's say there's 250 homes, that equates to over 14 million gallons of wastewater a year. So it's really important, again, that septic systems, um, you know, are properly working and properly recycling that water. And I do just want to note that as if you have questions as we're going through, please put them in the chat. It's good to ask them when you think of them. And we will have time at the end to answer any questions you put into the chat or any others that you uh, may have at the end of the seminar. So what do we add to the water? When you think about the wastewater that leaves our home, it's 99% water. So that 1% is what our septic systems and our wastewater treatment plants need to deal with. So we're going to talk about, and we're focusing on septic system today, how septic systems are going to remove the pathogens, the solids, how it deals with nutrients, and then the other things we put down the drain. So cleaning products, water treatment device backwash, medications, all of those things are also challenges for our septic systems to deal with. So first, looking at pathogens. So these are the things that make us sick. So viruses, bacteria, worms, protozoa, they have the risk to cause disease within our bodies. So when we are sick, we are shedding those viruses and bacteria. And if we're talking about our septic systems, we're not talking about things that we sneeze. We're talking about things that pass through our digestive system. That is primarily in our excrement. So that excrement, if you think about it, is inside our bodies, it's in our guts. And those bacteria and viruses were used to living in us, which is, you know, we're, we're pretty warm, right? Our inside of our bodies are 98 degrees. So when those bacteria leave our bodies, there's two challenges that our septic systems offer them. The first is temperature. It's much colder outside the human body. The second thing is, is these bacteria and viruses are not, uh, they, they do not thrive in an oxygen rich environment. So that's again, why we design to have that soil die off and treatment occur in, in that three feet of unsaturated soil. So it is the number one reason why we have a three foot separation requirement is to make sure the viruses and the bacteria are removed. So moving on to the solids. So I mentioned there's two forms of solids. The first, again, are organic solids. These are both digested and undigested animal and vegetable material. Also, there are some organic solids present in artificial organic compounds and cleaners and other products we use in our home. So these organic solids require oxygen to be broken broken down. So if we put these out in the environment, so that could be in our septic system, that could be into a lake, the microbes are going to work to eat up that organic material. But in order for them to do that, they are going to consume oxygen. So we design our septic systems again to provide that oxygen. If we were to directly discharge wastewater into a lake river stream, it's going to take the oxygen out of that water body lowering um, the oxygen available for the aquatic species living in that water. So how septic systems deal with these solids, some of them are stored in the septic tank and then removed when the tank is pumped. If we have an effluent screen, it'll help hold those solids back. But ultimately, these organic solids are going to serve as a food source for the microbes in the soil. The soil is full of microorganisms that when we start spreading sewage out in the soil, they come to eat up that organic material. So we actually size how large the soil needs to be, that treatment area, to make sure that we're gonna, we're gonna be able to spread that organic material out at a sustainable level for the microorganisms to consume. Unfortunately, not all of the solids we put down the drain are organic. So when it's when they're organic, that means the microorganisms present in the septic tank and out in the soil can digest them. But there are things like fibers from synthetic clothing, for instance, the lint that comes off of your washing machine, 
minerals, metals, and salts. If you think about your clothes, they're often dirty, right? And if they're dirty, some of that soil material, again, microbes aren't going to break that down. So the downside of these inorganic solids is they are inert, which means they cannot be decayed. If they make it to a water body, they can cause the water to be cloudy or turbid. And these inorganic solids also over time can cause the plugging of the soil pores. So out in your soil treatment system, that soil has only so much pore space. And if over time we fill it up with these inorganic solids, it can cause that system to malfunction. So we're not talking about something happening at five years. We're talking about how long do systems last? And really that question is a very difficult question to answer because it's kind of at like asking, well, how long do you drive a car for before it needs to be replaced? And well, that really gets to, well, how many miles do you drive? Do you take care of it? And those are really the two big factors with septic systems as well. So the more wastewater and the more solids that go out to your system, the less it's going to last. And that is also a function of how well you take care of your system. So we hope to hold as many of these solids back in the tank, but as I mentioned, over time, they may cause the soil pores to plug. So moving on to our nutrients, right? Nobody wants to swim in a lake that looks like this. So when we see a green lake, like, like that image shows, the growth of algae and weeds in lakes, ponds, and streams is really fed by how much phosphorus is available. Our fresh waters are phosphorus limited. The downside is this nutrient primarily comes from us. There can still be a little bit in household detergents, but we as human, we eat food that has phosphorus in it. We don't need it, so we excrete it in our urine. If you're putting undigested food into the system, that also may have phosphorus in it. Um, and finally, I mentioned small amounts in some household detergents, which we'll talk later about we should do everything we can to minimize. The good thing about, again, our septic systems is that unsaturated soil, that three feet of unsaturated soil, really does a good, good job at both absorbing and precipitating that soil, uh, that phosphorus onto and in the soil. And the good thing is when that happens, the, the phosphorus is basically stuck there. There are, again, soil, and not all soils are the same. So not so all soils are the same as far as how much absorption capacity they have or their ability to make those precipitates. So it's not to say everything's the same, but in general, our septic systems do a good job at removing phosphorus. Nitrogen can be a little bit more challenging. Again, nitrogen is a nutrient. Um, it also primarily comes from us, from both our urine and food breakdown, kind of same as phosphorus. It is present in some household cleaners and chemicals. Um, Ammonia-based cleaners would be the best example. Uh, the primary impact that nitrogen causes in the Midwest and in Minnesota where we reside is, is there's a federal drinking water standard for nitrate nitrogen of 10 milligrams per liter. So if we are putting excess nitrogen out into the environment and it's reaching, again, a groundwater source, it has the risk of contaminating that. Um, ocean environments are not phosphorus limited for their growth of algae and weeds. Like if you've ever heard about the red tides of algae in Florida, those, those waters are nitrogen limited. So they actually grow more weeds and algae when there's excess nitrogen. So how we deal with nitrogen and septic systems is different systems remove different, different amounts of uh, nitrogen. So we primarily put out to the soil ammonia nitrogen, and then we often go into an aerobic environment which converts that into nitrate. And again, this is a lot of chemistry and I'm not gonna get into all the details, but some systems, particularly mound systems, create an environment where that nitrate can be converted to nitrogen gas, which is called denitrification, which is nitrogen gas is no problem out in the environment. But there are other systems that may not adequately convert all of that nitrate into nitrogen gas. And so that is one of the biggest reasons why we have well setbacks, why we don't put a septic system right next door. But there are systems um, in sensitive areas, um, sometimes larger flow community systems where they actually are going to need to 
do advanced treatment to, to lower that nitrogen level below that federal drinking water standard of 10. So the last uh, topic is chemicals. And this is probably one of the more challenging areas and areas that we are doing more research on is to really measure and quantify um, how our wastewater treatment systems are dealing with cleaners and medications. I mean, I think about when I was a kid, what was in the medicine cabinet and what was below the sink. And there's just a lot more products going down the drain. And what we're finding is, is we're finding many of these emerging contaminants out in the water. So whether that be groundwater, whether that be surface waters, and at low levels, there have, there's been research showing um, some of these emerging contaminants can affect our aquatic food chain, impacting species reproduction, and even being found in people's drinking water sources. So the first and foremost thing is to think about what we're putting down the drain. But some things, again, if you think about that you need to be on a medicine, you need to be on a medicine, right? So some of those are going to be stored in the tank until they're pumped. And as I mentioned, we are gathering more and more information that many of these contaminants are being removed out in the soil, uh, but not all of them, so. With that, we'll now move into, so that's kind of our overview of the most common systems we see here in Minnesota and how they perform. I do wanna highlight there are other systems out there, systems in particular that have what I would call advanced pretreatment. So the septic tank is our one form of pretreatment, right? It's pretreating before the soil, but there are other systems that further treat the water before it goes out to the soil. So aerobic treatment units, media filters. They're not super common. They're usually used to overcome challenges, but when you have a really small parcel or you might have a cluster system going in for a group of homes, there are times when those systems, again, um, uh, are, can, are needed to deal with challenging situations. But with that, we're gonna move on to how do I take care of the septic system in my backyard? So first and foremost, you want to understand what you have. Do you have one tank or do you have multiple septic tanks? So sometimes people have several tanks in series. Do you have an effluent filter? Do you have a pump? So I mentioned mound systems have pumps, but sometimes even uh, regular drain fields or trenches have pumps. Um, pumps, again, are long lasting devices. Many of us have wells with pumps in them. Same thing, right? At some point in time, though, that pump will need to be replaced. The good news is that pump, uh, again, has an alarm on it, which will notify you uh, that, there's some, that there's a high water event. That may be something plug the pump. It might mean you need a new pump. But you'd want to know if you have one of those. So how would you get this information? Well, if you have a copy of your design or an as-built, um, and it really depends when your system went in, what kind of documentation, and you may have bought in the house after the fact, that is the perfect time that you want to contact your county or your permitting authority and get all of the records. So the records, uh, again, are very um, detailed. If your system was put in in the last 10 years, may not be as detailed. So the last resource is if you know who installed your system is to reach out to them or the next time you're having your system serviced, have your pumper, your maintainer, your service provider explain to you what's in your backyard. It's a great opportunity to learn more about what you have and also how's it doing um, when they come out to do that service visit. So I do want to highlight, though, that we put septic systems in because we are dealing with risk. So there is some risk associated with it. So the first risk is the there are gases produced. So I mentioned that you can smell a septic tank. So what you're generally smelling is hydrogen sulfide, um, which in very high levels is not good for us. But there's also methane being produced, which is flammable. So those gases are designed to vent back through your plumbing stack. So you shouldn't be regularly smelling right over your septic system a lot of gases. 
But just do keep in mind that they can be flammable and in uh, high levels are hazardous to humans. Wastewater contains pathogens. So that's again why we should never have a septic system that is surfacing or backing up. The next one is also very important to note that the septic tanks in your backyards have typically four to five feet of liquid um, in them. So that means if that lid was not secure and was at grade, child's pets and even adults could potentially drown in them. And unfortunately, I, you know, I, I regularly hear, and it's not always in Minnesota, but across the country about someone falling into a septic tank. Sometimes they get out and sometimes they don't. And we've had fatalities like that occur in Minnesota. Related to this is these things that are buried, people often think they're buried really deep, but in general, they're not. They're usually within a foot or two of grade. So tanks and other components can collapse if you drive over them with heavy equipment. So we never want to drive anything heavier than a riding lawnmower over our system. So some rules to protect your family and pets. One, you should never enter a septic tank. It's considered a confined space. You can actually pass out in a tank and potentially die. So we never are going to enter our tank uh, without, again, there's appropriate confined space entry requirements. Um, do not smoke or have a fire near your septic tank. Um, and uh, this seems like a no brainer, but sometimes people don't know where their septic system is and they build a fire pit over the top of their system. If wastewater is on the surface, the issue must be corrected. And during that time, access to that area should be limited. Um, do not use electrical tools near the water or wet ground. And this is true whether it be water or wastewater. It's kind of a no brainer. Um, keep vehicles and all other heavy equipment off the septic system. And finally, and maybe most importantly, make sure all lids are secured in place to prevent entry at all times. So one thing I did wanna highlight about the issue of maintenance um, and you know that video actually used the word or if you saw the title, it had inspection. And inspection and maintenance are two very different things. So in Minnesota, the word inspection typically means that they're going to be evaluating your system for regulatory compliance. So when they're doing an inspection on your home, they really look at three things. Is it not backing up or surfacing into your home? Do you have watertight tanks? And do you have that right separation to the limiting condition? Um, when you're getting an inspection done now, and this wasn't always true in the past, but now they're also going to empty or clean out your septic tanks for observation. So they will be doing maintenance during that visit as well. Um, but the key thing is, is during this inspection, if it doesn't pass, it will be required to be upgraded. And that, that time period is really based on several variables. So that's something to talk to your county about. Maintenance is very different. When you have someone come out to just maintain or clean out or service your system, that isn't going to have the same regulatory triggers and the key thing is, is they're really, they're going to look in your tank and they may give you a report, but they're not looking at that overall separation that the system has, and they're not filling out an inspection form. So moving on to our septic tank maintenance. So uh, every one to three years, the septic tank needs to be evaluated for the need for tank cleaning or pumping by an MPCA licensed maintainer. So if you're, when we talk about finding a professional, the classification we're looking for is maintainers. Historically, many people call those pumpers, but when you're searching for a professional, particularly on the search tool that exists here in Minnesota, you're looking for a maintainer. So there is no, again, magic number or answer. That interval is dependent on the size of the tank, so how do you have one tank? Do you have more tanks? How big are those tanks? How much water you use in your home and the habits within the home. So solids must be removed to, to prevent them from potentially either overloading advanced treatment or your soil, or in the worst case scenario, it could cause backing up of wastewater into your structure, cause surfacing out in your drain field or both. 
So here's a great video showing someone pumping your tank that we're going to skip over. So when we think about when does maintenance need to occur? Um, so the general rule of thumb is tank cleaning is needed when more than 25% of the tank is storing sludge and scum. So if you remember, again, in that you know, first diagram I showed of the septic tank, um, uh, if we add up the sludge at the bottom and the scum at the top, um, and think about a four foot liquid depth tank. So that means we couldn't have more than a foot of sludge and scum. So uh, this picture on the right is a good picture that again shows that your manhole may not be at grade. So you can see that lid that's there on the right. That lid again uh, was sitting on top of the tank and then it had, looks like about a foot of soil covering it. So that had to be dug up. This may be an instance or a good time to potentially also consider adding a riser to that tank to bring it to grade. So, uh, and this actually looks like it had two manholes and then one was sitting at grade. So they had added on over time. Uh, the other thing to consider is when the tank is cleaned, the, the term sludge is very accurate, right? The sludge is sitting on the bottom of the tank and he's using a pry bar here in this picture to try to kind of mix it up. Sometimes they'll do flushing and back flushing. Sometimes they'll be adding water anything they can do to get that tank as clean as possible. So it's very important we clean the tank through the correct access. So on some older systems in particular, the image you see on the right is all you'll be able to see, which is often a six inch um, inspection port um, over the tank. That inspection port is generally sitting over the manhole. So what needs to happen is that lid needs to be, that manhole access needs to be dug up like you see with the picture on the left. Um, so you just simply cannot get a tank clean. So if you do something on the right, let's say it's an emergency and it's in the winter and you can't dig it up. The downside is, is when you access the, the, the cleaning, and it doesn't end up being a cleaning. They, they really only take out the liquid and they leave all the sludge and scum behind, which really defeats the purpose um, of maintenance. So if you're cleaning a screen, uh, like we see here, uh, you notice he's cleaning the screen right back off into the septic tank. That's what we want to do. Uh, it's ideal, again, uh, that that screen certainly be cleaned when the tank is being serviced but some people will need and want to clean their screen more frequently. So such as every six months, some people will do it in the spring and the fall. And in that instance, it's better to wash that screen off at the front end of the septic tank. So those solids that we're washing off the screen don't directly go to a downstream component. So when your tank is being serviced, you should be getting a report. And again, this report is actually required in Minnesota regulations. Some of the most critical information on that report is the amount of sludge and scum. So how dirty was your tank? And I actually encourage you to be there and kind of talk to the maintainer when they're visiting your system. Maybe, maybe you need to have your tank pump more frequently than you thought. So are there any problems with your system, such as tank leakage, any safety concerns, any troubleshooting or repairs that are needed or conducted? It's kind of like when you get your oil changed and they do their 12 point inspection, you know, they can even be walking over your drain field um, and really giving you an overall feel of how your system is performing. So if you're not getting a report, if you're just getting an invoice, I would encourage you to ask for a report and again, be on site when that's occurring. So what about additives? So I'm convinced that if you went to your local hardware store, big box, small box, doesn't matter, uh, they'll be selling septic system additives. But to date, we have no third party research that supports their effectiveness. And the fact of the matter is when you use your septic system, you are adding bacteria, again, a you know, if you take a cup of wastewater, it has over a million microorganisms in it naturally. And you and your family are the feeders. So there's lots of food present in our wastewater. 
And the potentially the most concerning one is cleaners. So cleaners, and again, uh, had the risk of taking the stuff that was sitting on the bottom and actually putting it into suspension, which is certainly problematic. So how would you go about hiring? So maybe you do need someone to clean out or service your system, or maybe you need an inspection. So in either case, I'd always recommend people talk to their neighbors and friends, find out who they had a good experience with. And this is true of if you need a new system installed as well. Um, if you go to the MPCA website, they have a search tool. The address is very long. So if you just Google MPCA SSTS license search, you can pick what kind of septic professional you're looking for and then a county. Do keep in mind that many people do not, that's the county they live in. Most people in this industry do not just work in the county they live in. So you can certainly look at nearby counties as well. And then if we're specifically looking at a maintainer, you may wanna ask them, do you pump through the manhole? Do you have a sludge judge? That's the device that brings up that profile of the tank. Do you back flush? Do you recommend additives? We often go to the last one, which is how much does it cost? But keep in mind cost between many of these services is a small, it's a small difference. And knowing that your system is getting properly serviced um, is much more important. So finally on maintenance is record keeping. So um, some jurisdictions require that a report submitted to them when service is performed. So if you live, for instance, in, you know, kind of the seven to 10 county metro area, many of those counties keep records. There's a few outstate Minnesota do as well. This is also true if you have advanced pretreatment systems. So that, may, that report of service may go in. And again, that's not compliance. That's just the, yep, the system was taken care of. But it's always wise to keep record of your system design, installation, and service reports. Um, it makes selling in the future um, easier because people are always wanting to know what kind of septic system they're getting and that it was properly taken care of. So your permitted authority uh, will keep copy of these records, but having a copy for yourself um, may be helpful if problems arise. All right, so now we're gonna, just a quick thing about private wells. Um, most of us who have a septic system also have a private well. So you are not just operating your septic system, you are also operating your drinking water system. So these are the general recommendations from the Department of Health is to be checking for coliform bacteria. So coliform bacteria is present in the excrement of all warm blooded animals. So if you had coliform bacteria in coliform bacteria in your system, it would tell you you have some way that wastewater is getting in. So nitrate again, um, and manganese in particular are both a problem for infants uh, that are consuming that water. Um, arsenic again is naturally occurring and has a health risk. And lastly, lead. And you'll see why arsenic and lead are only once is you either kind of have it or you don't. Lead gets into our water from our plumbing system. Arsenic, again, is just naturally occurring, but the others uh, can really cha potentially change, particularly the bacteria and nitrate um, over time. All right, so the last topic we're going to cover is what we can do within our home to manage our septic system. So these are home management tips. So the first topic really focuses around what we put down the drain. So the general recommendations are to listen for drips and leaks. So going back to how much water that is used in our home is due to leaks. Um, when we have that, that toilet where we have to jiggle the handle to get it to seat, um, we really want to fix those, uh, you know, dripping faucets. Those are things we have control over. Uh, the second one is, is the next time you need particular Particularly, you need a, a new uh, clothes washer, choose an appliance that offers both water and energy efficient cycles. So that, again, will cut back on the water going out to our septic system. Um, we should never use our toilet or our septic system in general as a garbage can. Um, there's a lot of 
waste that is being put down the drain um, and particularly our toilets have such a, you know, have a large passageway um, that really shouldn't be going down the drain. We want to limit the use of harsh cleaners and sanitizers. Uh, those sorts of products do not know who good bacteria and bad bacteria are, so they kill indiscriminately. So the general recommendation here is to use natural or biodegradable products. I have a website here that's the Environmental Working Group. Uh, they actually, uh, they will give grades to cleaning products, A, B, C, D, or F. And it's really for their impact to public health and the environment. But if they're good for public health and the environment, they're also better for your septic system. So with that, we're gonna look specifically at our toilet. Um, when we think about that our toilet is our number one water user in our home, we want to replace toilets like you see here in the image on the right. And my joke with this again is both your realtor and your septic system would like you to do a remodel. Keep in mind though, the cost of a new toilet is pretty low. That's not a whole remodel, but just the toilet itself. Um, a few years ago, I, for instance, put a dual flush toilet in. So there's a smaller flush for urine. Uh, 0.7, where you'll see here most, uh, but most standard toilets you buy now are all 1.6 gallons or less. So this can make a significant difference in how much wastewater your home is generating. So those gaskets, as I mentioned, if not replaced, can add hundreds of gallons of extra water to your system per day. When it comes, a few other things about the toilet, um, many of the cleaners that are used uh, to clean toilets are very hard. Um, you never want to use the cleaners that make your toilet bowls blue or are constantly sanitizing your system. Um, so using a small amount of cleaner with more elbow grease is the general recommendation. Um, we are only going to put toilet waste or human waste and toilet paper into our toilet. So you can see there's a long list, Kleenex, Q-tips, cigarettes, certainly all of the sanitizing wipes. Those things do not break down. And so they just persist and cause problems within our septic system. If we want to cut back uh, even more on water usage, uh, using uh, showers use less water than baths. So that's one thing to consider. Low flow fixtures use less water. Um, we do want to avoid also within our shower using daily cleaners. So there's sprays, for instance, that recommend after every shower you spray. Uh, the downside of those is they are adding, um, again, a sanitizer and also, also what's called an emulsifier. So that mildew that stuff that would kind of build up in your shower, it tends to move that off your walls, but it also has the risk of moving it through your septic system. You want to avoid antibacterial soaps, good old fashioned bar soap. You use less of it and it does the job just as effectively. The takeaway is the less soap and cleaners, the better. Uh, that's true for our septic system. It's also true for the environment in general. So if you have a clogged drain, you first really want to think about how did it get clogged? Um, if you have you or yourself or people in your home longer hair and soap, it can be a magical thing that clogs up drain. So we need to try to catch as much of that before it goes down the drain. So in showers, tubs, and laundry. So buying inexpensive metal or plastic drain screens can really help. When drains do plug, it's often in a trap below the sink. So that's where we can take it apart or, or use a plunger or snake. If it's further downstream, that's where, again, we're much better off to have a professional come out and figure out where the problem is and clear it versus putting a nasty product down the drain that really could negatively impact the microbes out in our system. So moving on to laundry. So uh, you'll see the image on the right. So a front loading washing machine uses 65% less water. There's also efficient top loaders if you really don't want a front loader that also, again, we should be shooting for something that uses less than 20 gallons per cycle. The nice thing about these, they also do not have an agitator in them when they're uh, front loaders like these. And the agitator 
causes more lint to come off your clothing, which we'll talk about here in a second. The other benefit with a lot of these newer models is they use the, uh, they get the clothes drier. So you actually save money on your dryer because you don't need to run it as long. So we do want to run full loads whenever possible and as much as we can spread out that the laundry across the week. So if you can do a load a day, if you had seven loads in a week, much better than Saturday laundry day, because uh, then we're putting a lot of water out within a relatively short period of time. So moving on to that lint conversation. So we all have lint filters on our, on our, on our dryer, right? Well, believe it or not, more lint comes off in the washing machine. And that's because we're literally <clears throat> typically agitating our clothes and running water over it. So a lot of that lint then passes out with the laundry water. So you may consider adding a washing machine lint filter. Uh, and this shows in that person's hand, which came out of that device in the back is just a filtering device. It's not all just synthetic lint, right? There can be all kinds of things that, you know, are on our clothing that that filter will catch. So you can try a simple screen on the discharge line or the other recommendation is to purchase and install an aftermarket lint filter. I wish washing machines had lint filters in them. That would be great. Maybe someday we'll have those, but uh, that's very uncommon right now. So a few other things about laundry, limit the amount of bleach you do uh, or bleach you use and any other sanitizing product. There's actually now laundry detergent that's been marketed over the last few years that, that is sanitizing. Every load has a sanitizer where in general that is not needed to get our clothes clean. Um, you want to avoid inexpensive powder products that contain clay. So uh, clay can be used as a filler in laundry detergent, but the problem of clay is it tends to not settle and pass through the system. The other thing to think about with detergent here is how much detergent do you need? So I remember the last laundry detergent I bought, right? It's a big container. It says it does 100 loads, but it has a really big cap on the top. It's almost hard to figure out how much to put in. But usually, particularly if you have soft water and the newer, more efficient washing machines just don't need as much soap. The less soap out to our septic system, the better. Uh, we do not recommend the use of liquid, in particular fabric softeners, as there's some anecdotal evidence that it may affect a tank's forming those nice three layers we talked about. So things to use instead that are more natural is baking soda or vinegar, dryer balls, which kind of kind of soften your clothes and beat around in your dryer. And if you have a lot of static, an aluminum foil ball will help with that issue. So moving on to our kitchen. So the general recommendation here is to run a full dishwasher. Um, that has been found in research to use less water than washing in the sink. But if you do wash in the sink, you also don't wanna be running the water. You wanna fill it up right to wash and a little rinsing, but not rinsing everything as you wash it. Um, make sure the detergent you use in your kitchen is phosphate free. It is banned, phosphorus is banned in laundry detergent, but there's still some other soaps, anything that causes bubbles, soaps or surfactants that have uh, phosphorus in it. So just make sure you're not using phosphorus here. Um, in your sink, you want to scrape your plates into either a compost bin or the garbage, fix your leaks, and fats and oils are always solid waste. They should never be going down the drain. Um, other things to conserve here, uh, thaw your food in the refrigerator versus using running water. And then if you have a garbage disposal, uh, you really want to use it as minimally as possible or not use it at all. Um, the downside of garbage disposals is you're going to add more food out to your system. That undigested food has not gone through our digestive system. Our digestive system takes, you know, big things, right? A piece of broccoli and breaks it down into small proteins. So, um, and carbohydrates, right? So the things that end up out there are much smaller and easier to further degrade in the septic tank. The other challenge of garbage disposals is we do chop everything into little pieces and those pieces don't settle out as well. 
So if you have a, if your system was designed for a garbage disposal, it actually has more capacity for storage. But I would also just be conservative in how you use that garbage disposal. We just don't want to have solids um, overloading our system. So with that, we'll move on to our utility room. So this is maybe for most of us in our basement. Some highlights here are to not allow any clean water from sump pumps or tile lines to drain into your system. It's just simply hundreds or thousands of gallons that can overwhelm our system. We're never going to run water to prevent a system from freezing. Um, and lastly, you want to consider routing other uncontaminated sources out of your system. So furnace condensate, which can cause freezing, dehumidifiers, maybe not as much in our climate, but they can put out a fair amount of water. And then there's all the backwash water from water softeners, iron filters, and reverse osmosis. Sometimes the question comes up, what do you do with all this other water? Um, if you have a sump pump or a tile line discharge, it could potentially go there. Um, otherwise, the challenge for many people to get this other water out is they often have to put in some sort of sump to get it out of their basement. Um, it, these things cannot run directly into a lake, river, or stream. So if you're running them out on the surface, it can, you know, particularly the salt from your water softener um, can kill your grass. Uh, but there, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it going on the surface as long as it doesn't again go into a lake, river, or stream. While we're in that utility room, I just do want to hit on hazardous waste. So this would be, you know, paint products, anything else in your home that would go to your hazardous waste that's, you know, a liquid. Um, those should never go into our system. Um, there's a good resource here, and you don't need to necessarily write down this address, but if you literally, are, if you have a lot of unused medicine and you go to the FDA website, they actually have a search tool where you put in your zip code and it tells you the closest location that will take back those unused medicines. All right, so out to the soil treatment system. So outside your home, and I just love this picture, right? So this is a downspout, right? Coming from someone's either inside their house or sometimes from roofs, I've seen these too. We never, if you think about your tank lid there, want to add extra water in the area of your tank. Again, that tank should be 100% watertight, but we can see right in that picture, right? That there's, there's a joint there and there are other joints within our system that can potentially let water in. So we don't want a lot of water running to that area. So we wanna make sure there's no treated water from pools or hot tubs going into the system because that has sanitizer in it. Make sure our roof drains run away from the septic system and never park vehicles or boats, you name it, anything heavy over the top of our system. So I mentioned that the soil has aerobic conditions. So that means there's oxygen in the soil. The way the oxygen gets into the soil is the air we're all breathing is 21% oxygen. That oxygen and that air diffuses into the soil. So if we compact or drive over the top of that system, the air won't be able to get there to create those aerobic conditions. In addition, it can also close the pores so water can't move through it which is also not positive for our septic systems. So some considerations when it comes to landscaping, uh, we really do not want to irrigate or fertilize over our septic system. We're putting so much water out there that has nitrogen and phosphorus, we just don't wanna add extra. As I mentioned, nothing uh, bigger than a riding lawnmower. And we shouldn't grade or add soil over the top of our system without either talking to your installer or your permitting authority. Uh, there, we just don't wanna have too much cover and how we would place cover material could potentially impact the system. So when it comes to vegetation, this is probably one of the more common questions we get, what can I grow on top of my septic system? Well, some first things we should do, we really do want to get a good vegetative cover over the top of the system. And the two goals of that vegetation are to prevent erosion and also for, to protect the system from freezing. Frost goes down deeper, right, if you don't have soil 
or if you don't have vegetation growing across the top of the soil. You do want to plant native drought tolerant plants. And what I mean by this, if you think about this summer, right, we've had, had a very dry summer, but the minute we get a little bit of rain, the grass comes back to life. And that's great. Once grass, for instance, is established, and even other perennials, they don't die off just because it gets dry. So we don't want to plant things that need a lot of watering over the top of our drain field because of all of the water. And this is true of mounds, whatever kind of soil treatment system you have. So it is okay to plant trees and shrubs at a distance. And you'll notice I use the word dwarf. You know, there's many now ornamental trees that don't get 100 feet tall, right? It may be, you know, 20 feet tall. Some of the flowering crabs or dogwoods or other things that can help maybe shield off the area, protect it from traffic, make things more aesthetically pleasing, but aren't going to be, you know, that 50 to 100 foot tree. So what we don't want to do is plant edible plants such as vegetables and herbs over our system. Most of our systems are put in below the rooting depth of these plants. So it's not as much about uptake of viruses and bacteria. It's more going into winter. What, does, what do most people's vegetable gardens look like? They don't have a good vegetative cover across the top. So we're not meeting our goals. We are never, we should never place or allow trees and shrubs to grow over the top of our soil systems or near any of our other components because someone's going to need to service that. So if you plant a bush right next to your, to your manhole and it looks cute and little, well, you know, five years from now, it's a big old bush, right? It's five feet tall and five feet wide and they will have trouble getting into service your unit. Um, you never want to place plastic landscaping sheets over your system. That does not allow oxygen into the system. So things to avoid are thirsty plants that set deep roots and aggressive, uh, dense ground covers that interfere with evaporation. So we want to choose, again, drought-tolerant plants, short, fibrous root systems that are hardy and tolerant of your climate, and also of the sun that you're going to get in your backyard. So something that will easily grow there. So you'll see for the most part, this is pushing you or encouraging you to have uh, really grass in that area. Um, there, there are, again, some other species, um, some other plants that certainly can work in that area as long as they meet these definitions. So a couple other things here, and then we'll wrap this up, setbacks. So there are, our rules have very formal setbacks from things like lakes, rivers, and streams. But keep in mind that there are some other setbacks that are just simply a good idea because over the long term, your septic system is needed, is going to need to be accessed and potentially repaired. So as I mentioned, we have formal setbacks to wells and, and lakes. But other things to consider, and some of your counties may have setbacks, but not all of these are in state rules. But think about retaining walls, walkways, pools, hot tubs, decks and patios, fire pits. And a good rule of thumb generally is to keep those things 10 feet away from your system. And some of them, again, um, certainly never over the top of your system. So swimming pools, sport courts, storage sheds, swing sets, sandboxes, driveways, vehicles, again, all of those nowhere near your system. The other thing to consider is how is a pumper truck going to access your system? If you put in a fence, will they be able to go through it, over it, under it? So they are going to need to be able to access your system. So what about freezing? So we live in Minnesota, it gets cold, right? But not, if it was just that it got cold and we lived in Minnesota, everyone's system would freeze. So if you had freezing issues with your system, um, you really want to identify why did it freeze? So was it one of those winters where we don't get any snow cover and it gets bitter cold? That can be some of the most challenging winters. If the area has been compacted, that pushes out the airspace and that also uh, drives frost deeper. 
Is it irregular use? So this would be people who use their cabin very sparingly or leave for months at, at the time, those lucky people who get to leave the cold. Um, but there's other things. Is there cold air entering the system? Is there poor drainage? I talked about high efficiency furnaces. If you, if you leave your furnace on and you have that slow stream of condensate, it can freeze in the pipe and eventually cause problems. So the remedy is, is to figure out why and where it froze, because there have been many instances also where people get a dip in their pipe from their house to their tank, and that's where it freezes. So that's a problem we want to correct. Um, if this happens in the middle of winter, it's the worst case scenario is you might have to pump and haul for the winter. There are some people who do that with their cabins. They know they're not going to use it enough. Um, some people will go as far as adding heaters into their system to prevent it from freezing. So other prevention would be letting your grass grow long. So many people right around Labor Day, they stop. Um, mulch or using insulating blankets also can be laid out in the fall, rolled up in the spring, used every year. You can use water, fixing leaks, all of those are good uh, prevention techniques. So a few issues about seasonality. Um, it is better to pump your tanks in either the late spring or early fall between there. Again, the summer is fine too. We just really don't want to be pumping our system right before winter or during the winter. Um, if you have very low use in the winter, as I mentioned, you may want to use it as a holding tank. If you leave your furnace on, keep in mind that issue of your high efficiency furnace. And on our website, which I'm going to show here in a minute, if you operate a home uh, that's your vacation home or a cabin, we have some seasonal recommendations um, around that on our website. So some key takeaways, and then we'll get to your questions. One is to conserve water. Uh, the less water, and it's not just the water, it's what's in the water, uh, going out to our system, the better. Thinking about staggering your water usage. So um, for instance, some people, if you think about, I mentioned Saturday laundry day, well, while they're doing laundry, they're also running the dishwasher, right? People are showering. That can be a day where they really put a lot of water out. So as much as we can, avoiding those big peak days on a regular basis. So be mindful of the products you use and limit cleaners going down the drain. Um, don't use your septic system as a garbage can. And finally, think about what, what your yard looks like. Evaluate your vegetation, obstructions, and traffic. All of these things, again, will just help lengthen the life of your septic system. So for more information, um, and again, Chris, if you want to say a few words here, I'm just going to go through these. But I mentioned Ottertail County sponsored this. They I listed their website as a resource if you're um, a resident of Ottertail County. The second one is our uh, website at the University of Minnesota, septic.umn.edu. We have a whole page targeting property owners. Uh, the next one is the MPCA website. Uh, that's where you can find lots of information as well about septic systems in Minnesota. And the last one, again, is EPA's website that has a lot of great information for property owners as well um, about septic systems. So with that, uh, we can certainly answer questions. And as I mentioned, Chris, if you have anything to say uh, locally about Ottertail County. Sure, I can do that. I can do that now. Uh, welcome, everyone. I see there's a lot of uh, people online watching this right now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you are from Ottertail County. I, I just wanted to go over some quick stats here in Ottertail County. Uh, we issue, on average, about 680 septic permits in Ottertail County a year. Our banner year was in 2021 when we issued just a little over 800 of those, and one of the questions we get a lot is, uh, do I need a mound? There's there's kind of a myth out there that if I replace my septic system, it has to be a mound. So that's a very common question that we get. The reality is in Ottertail County, and I worked in a county previous to my time here in Ottertail County, and it's pretty consistent with the other county I went to as well, or worked for as well, is roughly a third of the systems that we permit uh, our mounds for the reasons that Sarah detailed. You know, it's all based on that three foot of vertical separation. It really is dependent on the soil that's on the lot. 
Ottertail County is blessed with really good soil. We have a lot of good sandy soil, but we also have a lot of lakes. And with those lakes, there's a lot of hydrology in the county that's connected. We have a lot of high water table. The other most common system that we see, uh, given that we live in lakes country, uh, we have a lot of seasonal residents. Our population quadruples in the summertime is we have a lot of seasonal cabins or homes on a lake that are just on a holding tank and that is allowed in our ordinance. And that makes up for roughly about 30% of the systems. Uh, our, our compliance inspections, we do require compliance inspections at certain times. Uh, uh, the most uh, frequent would be uh, when you sell your home, you have to get your, your septic system looked at. Other triggers that would uh, uh, require the county to have you look at your septic system is when you come in and pull a permit or apply for a variance. And we are pretty consistent with the rest of the state with our compliance numbers, roughly three quarters of the systems that get inspected when they sell their home are passing. Uh, we see about 25% of the compliance inspections that we get uh, coming back as non-compliant and we require upgrades of those systems. And finally, uh, Ottertail County also has financial assistance. If a resident of Ottertail County uh, is required by the county to replace their septic system, we have uh, financial assistance in two forms. The first is a grant that we get from the state every year uh, that is uh, income-based, so you have to be low income to qualify for that grant. And it's basically free money. We, we, we uh, pay uh, up to $5,000, 50% of a system, up to $5,000 of, of money. And that's on a first come first serve basis. We usually run out of that money around July. Uh, we get enough traction with that program that about eight to 10 people a year take advantage of the grant program. The other uh, financial assistance we have is what we call a septic or a SSTS loan program. We get a grant from the state. Basically, the county pays for the cost of your system, and then we put that uh, cost on your property taxes, just like a street assessment or a sewer assessment if you're on city sewer, and uh, you pay that off in your property taxes over 10 years. Currently, that's at 0%, but the money that funds that program uh, ends in April of next year. We are currently re-upping that grant and we met with the state last week. Uh, unfortunately, they have to start charging interest. Uh, so after April of next year, anybody who gets a loan from the county will have to pay a nominal uh, interest rate. I think it's like a percent and a half. So it's still pretty cheap, but it's a way to defray the cost of a septic system over a decade. Uh, that's kind of a brief update or, or uh, a synopsis of what Ottertail County does with septic systems. And at this point, if you have any questions regarding what I said, please put it in the chat and I'll address those. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yep, I'm going to start going through questions here. Um, and I meant, I'm going to send something to you, Danielle, if you can. Oh, here's everyone. So the videos that I was going to share, I just put in the general chat to everyone. So that's the EPA. Uh, so all the videos that I kind of skipped over today. Um, uh, and we had thought we had troubleshoot this before it started, but I don't know why the issue came up today, but I'm gonna get to your other questions. So plantings near a drain field. And I know some of these are gonna be, have been a little answered, but I think people are wanting to know specifically about distances. So, um, a rhubarb plant is much easier to me. Like, so as long as the rhubarb plant isn't over the system, uh, it, it can be closer than our general, than trees. Trees are a little different. Trees send out much uh, roots um, at a much further distance. So uh, so I would say the rhubarb, I if I were gonna put a vegetable garden in tomorrow, how close would I have it? I'd say I'd keep about a five foot barrier between there. And just think about traffic, particularly to your tanks too that you don't really want them tromping through there. Um, as far as trees, again, um, then you're looking at more of that, I would say 20 plus feet, um, just to provide a buffer between there. Um, so the next one is, how does a small household living in a big house impact septic system maintenance? So um, if you live in Minnesota, again, your system um, has to still be looked at every three years, but it does not need to be cleaned. So generally people, when people have systems that are designed for much larger homes and have low occupancy, you, you may only have to get your tank. But so let's say you're having it looked at every three years. It may only need to be pumped every six years. 
So, um, and sometimes you may only need to have the first tank pumped instead of all of the tanks. So that's again, why it's good to talk to your pumper or maintainer. Cause sometimes they just show up and they clean it all because they show up with a vacuum truck and that's what they do. So, um, so moving on, is it worthwhile to put down a sewer mat? And I'm assuming you're talking about the kinds that are designed to protect from freezing. The whole freezing issue is a difficult one in that most systems, the pipe from your house and some of your tank and, some, and your drain field are above the frost step and some systems don't freeze. So if you're having freezing issues between your house and your tank, more often than not, there's a problem with that pipe and you should fix it because there's usually a dip in that pipe because they're all designed to slope. Um, and so if you have, again, a 1% slope on that pipe, it shouldn't be freezing. So that's why I mentioned if you, and so some people feel much better. So sometimes the issue with insulation or putting down a mat is if you've had a problem, you never want to have it again, and you're going to take measures to prevent it. Um, and so there's, it's, there's nothing bad of it as long as you take it out come spring. Um, is it okay to use, uh, is to use constant constant cleaning products. I would never use a constant cleaning product in my toilet. Um, just because it most toilet products are designed to prevent bacterial growth within the toilet um, and any sort of buildup. And the term safe for septic systems is 100% unregulated. Anybody can put it on the outside of a package. So I would rather you once a week clean your toilet bowl with a minimal amount of cleaner than constantly sanitizing the system. Yep, so the next question, uh, leaves or septic blankets, all are okay. Um, Chris, do you have a link for the loan program? Did you see that one? You I'm working on it now. right now and I'm, I'm putting it in the chat and it's not kind of, I, I put it in there and hit send and it's not working. Unless it did, it, maybe it went away. To everyone, maybe, but I'm just going to keep moving. So. And, and, um, and, and, and to answer the quite the follow up question on that is, it can only be used for replacement systems, not for a new home. So it has to be a system that's been required by the county to be replaced. Oh, I missed that. Sorry, um, Beth. This is septic related. The difference between advanced septic design license and a regular septic design. So uh, there are actually three levels of designers and inspectors in Minnesota. So most of the systems, again, that go in, and I would say it's 95% or more, are conventional standard trenches, beds, mounds, accrades. Those can all be designed by a basic designer. So that is what most property owners need. But if you needed more technology, so you needed an advanced pretreatment system, like I mentioned, an aerobic treatment unit, a media filter, or you had a system that was over 2,500 gallons a day. So now you're talking about a resort or restaurant. Those require either an intermediate or advanced designer license. So if you have a very challenging parcel, though, and you don't think a regular system is going to work, that's also where you might want to find an intermediate or in advance, so. All right, so the question, when Sarah was talking about out-of-date tanks, she may, mentioned that some tanks are made of cement. Oh, that's kind of, so, um, so, and when I say cement, it's really, again, concrete, uh, precast concrete tanks. Um, and so they were actually, again, designed or manufactured to leak. Those are the cesspools, dry wells. Um, concrete tanks are still the most common tanks used. There are plastic or fiberglass tanks that can be used in Minnesota as well. The challenge with them sometimes is depth of bury, so they can't be buried as deep as concrete just because of strength issues. So, um, so that's something something to think about um, down the road. So, so I think there were a couple. Some people have multiple pipes sticking out above their tanks, or I think someone also mentioned many uh, manholes. So some of the newer tanks, again, will have three manholes, one at the big, and particularly if there are two compartment tanks, which we didn't get into, one at the front, one at the back, one in the middle. So there are just multiple ways to get the tank clean and, the, and, and service, because you think about right where that pipe comes in, and sometimes they might have to clear the line or it's, it's areas that service are, are, services needed. 
So, um, and kind of Justin's question is similar too. So the one right by the house might be a clean out, then, then you'll have them over your tank, but you'll also have them in your drain field. So there are inspection ports in your drain field to measure ponding. So to really understand what those all are, you almost have to look at your design and see how things then compare to your backyard. But it's another time to have your pumper, your maintainer, your installer explain what they all are. Um, the next time they're out might work as well. So, so I know there were two questions in particular. I hear, I, and I saw two brand names brought up. Um, the one uh, advertises on TV, which would be Ridex. The other I Googled also says it's a septic system additive. Um, and my answer to those would be my answer answer from before, that there is no third party research. So I would rather take that money and have your system regularly maintained. Um, there's just, again, no independent research showing those products are beneficial. And I understand that there are testimonials all day long on some of their websites, but testimonials are not science. They are testimony. And so until we get a product, that has gone through some third party independent testing, I can't recommend the use of, of any of them. All right, are you guys seeing any that I miss? Yes, Sarah, did you see there's a question John asked about, uh, is there a good time to pump if it's only a summer home, spring or fall? That's a great question. Yeah, um, I, I would do spring over fall if I had to pick between spring and fall or the middle of summer. So I kind of said, late spring because we don't we have road restrictions anyway so there's very little pumping that happens until road restrictions are lifted um they can do emergency pumping during the winter but not regular maintenance so anywhere from late spring to early fall for a seasonal cabin is fine the other practical thing i just want to bring up for everyone though is um what happens when your tanks are pumped where does that go a lot of it in Minnesota goes on to fields. Um, it either goes on fields and it has to be lined and there's all kinds of federal requirements or it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. If it's going to farm fields and being used as fertilizer, they're going to want to clean your tanks in the spring and the fall, not generally in the middle of the year because of because there's restrictions on when they can take uh, crops off those fields. So some of, you know, you also want to work with your maintenance company to figure out, you know, when you can get in and when best works for them, so. Sarah, there's also a question about using, um, you know, the pod, uh, the pod. Oh, I did see that dishwasher. one. I don't know why I'm not seeing them all. Yeah, I would say the pod question in general is uh, one we don't have really good research on. What, uh, Particularly, it's because it's both laundry and dishwashers. What I don't like the most about them is you have no control over um, how much you're using, right? It's already a predetermined amount. So I like the free flowing options better because then you can cut back. There is some concern that that stuff around the outside um, could, could have some plastic components to it, although it readily dissolves. So there's not, I, I've had people anecdotally tell me they've seen problems with systems where they're using pods, but it's always hard to know, is the pod the problem or is it something else? Yeah, I see, I also see um, Cheryl asked a question about holding tanks. Um, maintenance with holding tanks is just a little bit more straightforward because every time that holding tanks fills up, you're cleaning it out. So um, there's not a whole lot more to maintaining your holding tank. The only thing I would confirm is that you have an alarm on your holding tank also that tells you when the tank is 75% full or you're, you should have one of those. So you would want to make sure that alarm is working and operational so you avoid um, avoid a problem, certainly. so. There there was also a question about uh, requiring an inspection every three years. Um, that's not a thing in Otter Tail County. I don't know if any other jurisdictions require that. Uh, if you could address that, Sarah. Yeah, I am not aware of a jurisdiction that requires an inspection. And this really goes back to the definition between inspection and maintenance. So there are jurisdictions that require maintenance and require your system to be serviced, but not an official compliance inspection. So. 
Chris kind of went over some of the more common triggers between, you know, to, to get a required inspection. Uh, so that's often you're adding a bedroom, you want a permit, some counties you want to sell, but that's not typically the case. So, so I do see more. I didn't have them all open. So John, can I build a new drain field over an old one? Uh, the answer there would is generally that is your last case scenario. You are only going to do that if you have nowhere else to go because we've been we've changed that soil from putting all that water in there for so long. So sometimes it means we might have to excavate out the old system and bring in sand. It's it's just not ideal. So I won't say the answer is never. Uh, and it will have then additional permitting requirements typically because it's not, we just, we know how soil operates that hasn't been damaged and that area has been damaged. So. And, and I can answer that at Ottertail County. We actually changed our ordinance this year to require that uh, you can't do that if there's another spot on the property where you can put system in original soil. So when my staff gets a system for digging out an old drain field and putting a uh, a new soil treatment area in the same spot, the first question we always ask is, is this the last spot on the lot uh, for that system? In fact, I just had that email conversation with one of my staff during this production. So uh, we see it quite a bit, but my answer is very similar to Sarah's. It has to be the last spot on the lot for a system. There's a question about abandoned systems. Uh, how do I know if there's an old septic system on your property? If your septic system was updated 20 years ago, the answer is yes, there is an old septic system on your property. Um, so many people can often, uh, depending on the age of your house, there might be a couple. It, this one might be the first one. So generally when a septic system is abandoned, uh, the tank is crushed and left in place and filled and the rest of the system is just left there. They are typically not dug out unless you are gonna put something else. Like let's say you're gonna build a building there or but generally they are abandoned um, in place. And the only way you would know if your system froze in the past would, would be as if it was disclosed during property transfer. So most people's systems do not freeze, so I don't want everyone to be worried, but it just is a question that, re that tends to come up because it seems like every five years or so, we get a really tough winter in Minnesota that tends to find mistakes also that have been made over time. So I just wanted to um, to address that. I'm just looking if there's any. Um, yeah, how often holding tanks need to be pumped out again? Just as often as they fill up. So for some people, that's every couple of weeks. If it's mm -hmm. a really seasonal property, it could be every couple months. Yeah. There, there's a question about. Uh you know, particular or specific concerns about seasonal homes, if you want to address that quick, because we see a lot of those in Ottertail County. Yeah, I did um, respond um, to that with uh, our seasonal website too. I just want to get to a couple of these others at the end. I know we're at the end of time, so you guys can certainly uh, uh, go on your merry way if you have other things to do. So if too much water enters a system at once, does it cause overflow or untreated what problems? So let's say I mentioned the 4th of July and you have everyone you know over to your house, your septic system works that day, uh, unless you have a, a problematic system. So they can handle occasional peaks. What tends to happen during that time period is your soil treatment, your, your septic tank may get stirred up a little bit. So the settling may not be as good. The other thing is out in our soil treatment systems, there is some storage. So there's different distribution media that's used out there, rock or chambers or other things, and that can hold several days worth of water. So if too much water, but if you do that every single day, you will significantly decrease the life of your system. But if you do it for that occasional time, you have a lot of people over or a lot of out-of-town guests, um, that's not being a problem. So, yep, and I know it was shared. This is going to be... Um, uh, posted to our website. Um, and I don't know if that went in the general uh, conversation, uh, Dana, but maybe one of you can drop the location that the recorded webinar will be. So yeah, I'll be sending so out an email. Okay. 
Um, a mound system has to be either 50 or 100 feet from a well, depending on the well depth and casing. So it depends if it's a shallow well or a deep well, so. Oh, the search tool. Um, uh, maybe uh, Clayton, you can drop the search tool exact link into the chat for uh, finding a septic professional. Uh, so this next question also about financial assurance. So to be a licensed company in Minnesota, you do have to be bonded and you need to have insurance. Um, I am not aware of any other further financial ass assurance <laughs> uh, that is uh, required to be licensed in Minnesota. So those really are the two primary requirements is bonding and, ins and general liability insurance. Oh, the question, Justin, about additives. So since we don't recommend additives at the University of Minnesota, um, I uh, if they are going to be pushing additives on you, um, that would be a company you might consider hiring another company. And, and if they do suggest an additive, the question would I would ask them is, do they again, can they provide you third party independent research about the product's effectiveness? And I think lastly, I'm not sure if the seasonal, and if anyone actually wants to unmute now and have a conversation, we're down to you know about 15 people. Um, the seasonal issues really, I, I, I think every seasonal property, good or bad, is different. And so people use their cabins and lake homes very differently. Some people really use it very sporadically, and some people really sometimes use their lake home more in the summer than some homes get used year round because it's the place that everybody wants to go to. So I really think it depends on how you use water um, that you just want to think about some of that water. And also when you have lots of people using your system that don't know about septic systems, you have the risk of things being flushed that shouldn't. I've stayed at numerous friends' houses that literally have signs by their toilets and in their bathrooms telling people what to do and what not to do. Um, the other thing I think about with uh, vacation homes that are used a lot is thinking about laundry too. Like a lot of times people, they're you know swapping out a lot of bedding and towels and all of that is just to think about some of those issues too. I'm not seeing any other, does anyone else have any other questions to address? No, and I've already received an email from one of the participants offline that emailed me a question. So if anybody from Otter Tail County, if we missed a question or you think of something after we end this um, uh, production, if you think of something, please don't hesitate to call me or, or email me. Always happy to answer questions. Go ahead, Jody. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Well, I just wanted to share. I like that I, I am I'm a new... Um, a relatively new um, homeowner with a septic system. And I saw the sign of which I've had made up a small one by each of my toilets and it says, toilet tissue only, please. Our septic system thanks you. So thank you for an excellent seminar. Thanks for joining us. I have seen that um, also on the EPA Septic Smart website. They do it like in their um, content page. There is some printable flyers like that that mention that same thing. You know, just please only, you know, flush toilet paper, no wipes or anything like that. And I thought those were, there's one specifically for like VRBO type stuff. And Yeah, yeah. They have a couple around vacation. They have one for the kitchen too, because the kitchen sink is another notorious spot that people put stuff down the drain. So yeah, they were really targeting vacation home rentals, which is a whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but some of your homes may not be officially vacation home rentals, but people sometimes have them even when they're theirs. 
Sarah, I saw a new one pop up um, regarding abandoned systems. Can you plant vegetation over those? And how would they find out where the system had been located? I, so I would first go to, uh, so when I, when property transfer occurs, they are supposed to put the location of any known abandoned systems on the disclosure form, but sometimes it happened before the last owner, so they don't know. So then the second thing would be to contact your county to find out if they, or your permitting authority, it's mostly counties, but sometimes cities and townships, do they have any records of old systems? That's kind of it. Um, uh, so beyond that, um, once the system is unused and over a short period of time, anything that was viruses and bacteria is gone. They have a relatively short life. So you can really plant whatever you want over that area. Um, you know, trees. Uh, the problem of you, the only issue I could see, and it's pretty minor, is if it was uh, even the trenches, they're all 12 to 24 inches below the ground generally. So you're not likely to run into anything. Um, if you were digging a really deep tree and you hit some old rock, it just may not be a great spot for the tree because they don't want to be planted in rock and you don't want to dig in rock. So that's probably the only other concern, but I don't, there really aren't any concerns about what you plant over there. 